Hi everybody, this is the lecture for tw chapter 22, lesson two, part D. Uh, we're going to look at the characteristics of today's parties and how we got there. This video um, really explains this concept of party systems. You're going to hear me continuously use that phrase party systems to refer to an era in American history. These two videos here, you guys will be completing um, as well this week or today. Okay, let's take a look. All right, so our two-party system emerged in 1854. However, even though this started in 1854, the Democrats and Republicans of today are actually almost like the opposite of what they used to be, and we'll look at why that shift occurred. But this two-party system emerged in 1854, meaning this is when we have the Democrats and the um, Republicans, and since then, that's pretty much been the main two parties. You should remember that the Republicans replaced the Whigs as a major party. The Republicans formed because they needed, people wanted a party to oppose slavery. Something important to note is that Republicans, especially at the beginning, were not campaigning to abolish slavery. They simply wanted to limit its spread. It's a big difference. Um, Republicans supported business interests. They, um, they take a lot of the Whigs, a lot of Whigs join the Republican Party. Uh, but at first, it's mostly a party of Northerners. And Lincoln becomes the first Republican president in 1860. We all know that that is what um, was the final straw that broke the back and led to the secession of the South. So this document here, like this has lots of information. Um, I'm just going to kind of talk to you about the main takeaway. So from 54 <clears throat> to 96, Republicans hold the majority of national power. You have to remember, during the Civil War, Democrats bounced. They were like, hey, I'm out. They weren't in Congress really exercising their power. And even after the Civil War, remember, the Democrats had to really um, go through a lot of hoops in order to be allowed back into Congress because these were the former Confederates. So really, through Reconstruction, through the 1890s, remember, Reconstruction ends in the 1870s, through the 70s, 80s, 90s, the Republican Party is dominating the national scene. Um, African-Americans at this point, African-American men are able to vote, and they also would have supported the Republicans um, as the party of Lincoln, the party that abolished slavery, and also uh, pushed forward our Reconstruction Amendments. But you have to keep in mind, they were pretty much prevented from exercising their political rights. The Democrats at this time controlled the South. Um, locally, they were using tactics of fear and violence. Remember, we, we've looked at this at length in terms of how they were preventing the African-Americans from becoming equal. Um, at a national level, Democrats were controlled by Northern businessmen who opposed Reconstruction. So really, during this period, both parties are more controlled by business. And what we'll see happening in America at this time is this is the rise of big industry, um, especially like once the 1890s hits. This is where we're getting J.P. Morgan, um, Andrew Carnegie, J.D. Rockefeller. This is the big cities, big oil. Um, Edison comes out with the electricity. America in this time is shifting towards a more modern, um, shifting more towards the America that we realize. And it's important to note that throughout this, both parties were pretty much in bed with big business. They, they were controlled by people who had interest in, in these big businesses. But what we're going to see is a major shift. Um, again, starting through the 1896, again, Republicans start to dominate. They continue to dominate through 1932, but something really major happens. You should probably already be taking a guess that what happens is the Great Depression, okay? Um, even though in World War I, we do have Democrat Democratic President Woodrow Wilson, he only really gets elected because Teddy Roosevelt, as that third-party bull moose candidate, splits the Republican Party. So basically, since the Civil War to the Great Depression, the Republicans were just running away with the show. But it's the fact that the Republicans are so aligned with big business that that is actually what backfires. Because when the Depression hits, the Great Depression hits, um, <clears throat> many blame the government for just letting these big companies basically just do whatever they want and not pay attention to, hmm, could this potentially create a depression down the road? So in 1932, we have Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He is elected president, and he's a Democrat. He's actually elected four times. Um, he is 
it's his election that starts this shift in the dynamics of which party dominates the national scene. And also it helps shift the overall beliefs of the two parties. Um, just a quick little side note, you see FDR here is uh, photographed in a wheelchair. He was physically handicapped due to polio. He had contracted polio as a child. Um, throughout his presidency, he took great care to make sure that no one saw images of him in a wheelchair. Most Americans did not even know at the time that he was physically disabled. And, you know, I think about we've looked at the 60s and 70s as a time when marginalized groups like African-Americans, women, LGBTQ members um, start advocating for greater equality. We also see a pretty strong movement for disabled Americans also advocating for greater equality in society. And if you go to Washington, D.C., which I hope all of you have the opportunity to do, his memorial is probably my favorite place at the mall. When you go there, there's a full-size statue of FDR in his wheelchair and his cute little Scotty dog right there as well, um, which I think actually is on his lap here. However, that statue did not always exist. For the longest time, it was actually a statue of Roosevelt standing up straight, which he would not have been able to do without his wheelchair. Or maybe you know, he would have been able to do it, but he would have had limited mobility. He was pretty much wheelchair bound. And uh, many Americans with disabilities saw that this was like a joke, like why are we representing him not as he was? We should actually be celebrating the fact that you know, disabled Americans can look to him and say, wow, well, like we've been represented in politics. So they lobbied and actually got the statue changed. Kind of a cool story. So since the depression after Roosevelt, power will shift back and forth between Democrats, but um, their political ideologies start to change. This is where we get that fifth party system. This is where the Democrats start to resurge in their power from 1932 to 1968. Um, the main issue that's going to be dividing um, or causing a shift, as you'll notice when you watch the Vox videos, is the issue of civil rights. The issue of civil rights caused a major shift in the political <clears throat> alignment of Democrats and Republicans after 1965, and the parties basically reverse. The Democrats go from the party of white supremacy to a big tent party of multiracial voter, you know, voters of many different races, um, and they become more of a liberal party, whereas the Republicans, which, you know, when we think about what the term liberal means, using government to change society, the Republicans used to be a very liberal party. You know, they worked to abolish slavery. They passed all of those amendments. Um, but what's going to happen is Democratic President Lyndon Johnson, his support of the Civil Rights Act is going to basically cause people to shift tents. You guys will get a better understanding of that when you watch the Vox videos. So this is where we get into this concept of a six party system. Um, I believe that there is a six party system and that's the party system that we're currently living in today. Historians disagree about when exactly that fifth party system, the system broke down. Um, I really see that 1965 civil rights era, uh, 65 civil rights act is a major turning point. But we have um, Republican Richard Nixon's election in 68. That's a big moment, um, as well as Reagan's election in 1980. Republicans now dominate national elections in the South and the Mountain West, while Democrats win the Northeast and other urban areas. If you're interested more in this, this video is really interesting about how the two parties shift. Today, the two parties are more clearly divided ideologically than they've ever been since the Civil War. Republicans typically support that strong national defense, low taxes, and small government. They prefer state power over federal power. Democrats, on the other hand, support a strong and active national government and are more likely to support social programs and a progressive income tax to pay for them. So let's look at like the parties more specifically in today's terms. Generally, this is all very general. The Democratic Party believes that the federal government should take responsibility for many social problems, such as the age of the poor. Again, thinking about what the words conservative and liberal mean, this is clearly a liberal ideology. Let's use government to make changes. Whereas a conservative ideology says, let's use government to maintain the status quo, and let's use government to help individuals make change, right? To help private citizens lead that change and not have the government be doing it. 
Democrats are more likely than Republicans to support tax increases to pay for any of these social programs. Um, and Democrats are also more likely to support labor unions. When we look at the Republican Party in a very, very general sense, the Republican Party generally supports reducing the power of the federal government. Again, this is a major shift, okay? Because after the Civil War, the Republican Party greatly expanded the power of the federal government um, through the Civil Rights Acts and other issues. Um, today, Republicans tend to believe that state and local governments, as well as non-governmental organizations or NGOs, should take more or the most responsibility for social programs. Let's look at some more specifics. We're gonna go with the Democratic Party first. Um, if you notice, I've put up here like moderate, liberal, radical, progressive. You even could add like democratic socialists here. It's important to keep in mind that like, there's not just one type of Democrat, there's not one type of Republican, okay? Thinking back to like our ideologies here, um, people can kind of be in a spectrum even within one party. Typically, Democrats favor government regulation of the economy. Um, they support organized labor. They favor higher taxes for higher income earners and then a redistribution of that tax revenue to programs for the poor. Democrats typically believe that the ultra wealthy should pay more taxes because those taxes can then be used to help people at the bottom of society. Democrats view um, typically welfare programs and other social programs as necessary because we because there's so much inequality in America. Think back to the video we did on affirmative action um, and systemic racism, right? That systemic way that certain people, certain groups who have typically been at the bottom of society are kept at the bottom of society. Democrats see the economy more as rigged to favor the wealthy. Um, and they believe that it's important that we use taxes to support um, members of our society who are the least well off. They feel that they need that leg up in order to actually advance out of poverty. Um, looking at that third point, right, favor and keeping welfare in place. And then when it comes to schools, Democrats are more in favor of supporting the public school system and keeping the money within the public schools. Looking at Republicans, again, our moderate Republicans, conservative, our right wings, like those are the really far right, uh, they in general favor less government intervention in the economy. They don't want the government to be um, pulling strings. Uh, capitalism as a theory is supposed to work without any government intervention. This is what we call the invisible hand of capitalism. Democrats feel, look, yeah, there's an invisible hand to capitalism, meaning like the markets will just make the economy run, but the government needs to make sure that the hand, that the market is working the right way. Republicans typically are against government um, intervening in the economy. They also favor lower taxes. This is also one of the most major divisions between Democrats and Republicans is their philosophy on how much we should tax and what we should do with taxes. Whereas Democrats typically favor higher taxes and then using that money to support our most disadvantaged members of society, Republicans take a completely different approach. They, they say America should not be taxing nearly as much, that actually we should lower taxes so that Americans keep more of their money. And if Americans keep more of their money, they're going to have more that they can spend. And the more Americans spend and um, buy products, spend on services, that will actually help the economy grow. And when the whole economy grows, that helps everyone, right? It's this idea that a rising tide lifts all ships. They believe that, um, especially for the wealthy, that if you tax the wealthy too much, they're not gonna be motivated to make so much money. They feel that um, the best way to help the poor is to keep taxes low, especially keep taxes low on the rich, because if the rich can keep more of their money, they will invest it back in their communities. That's a theory called trickle-down economics. Basically, Democrats don't believe on the whole that trickle-down economics work. Trickle-down economics was an economic philosophy uh, introduced by Ronald Reagan. Um, Democrats reject that and basically think that it doesn't work and that it's just helping the rich get richer, whereas Republicans 
C, A, that um, trickle-down economics does work, and that B, it's more American because it's the government is taking less from the people. Um, Republicans also favor cutting back welfare benefits. Again, Republicans and this conservative view is more about less government because they feel that the government in a way can kind of hinder um, private citizens from making the most out of their lives. They also want to foster initiative or welfare recipients to find work. A lot of Republicans feel, or more conservatives feel that um, the welfare system basically encourages people not to work. Why would you work if you're just gonna get a welfare check? Um, however, it is important to note that the majority of welfare recipients do work full-time jobs. Um, just as like an example in our economy, we have what's called the minimum wage. We also have what's called the poverty line. Um, in America today, the 2020 um, Department of Commerce has say, said that in America, um, all around the country, on average, the poverty line for a family of four is $25,000. That if the family makes less than $25,000, you're considered to be in poverty. However, what's interesting to know is that in most places around America, because the minimum wage uh, for non-federal jobs is set by states, in the majority of states, even if you work full time at minimum wage, you will not make enough to be over the poverty line. So Democrats and Republicans, like they have different views on how best to help people. And it's just different. Um, Republicans, typically when it comes to education, um, are more about parental choice and they favor programs to allow parents to get tax vouchers to then let their kids go to other private schools. It's more about like choice. So those are kind of the basics, Democrats and Republicans. You can bet your bottom dollar that we will be looking more at um, our nominees for the 2020 election and their platforms. Uh, but that's what I have for you guys today. Make sure you watch those other two box videos and hope you enjoyed this lecture.